Um, my dogs will go nuts. I cannot peel a banana. I don't know how they can hear a banana peeling from three rooms away. Uh, and they're pretty deaf the rest of the time. But with they, there's a banana, so I guess maybe their sense of smell is working pretty well. Yes. Uh, but most fruits, apples, pears, blueberries, strawberries, uh, most of mine will spit out raspberries. I think they're just a little too tart for them. Yeah. Um, but green beans, broccoli, carrots, any of that kind of stuff is great for them. Uh, I but, make, but, but do they like it? I mean, they love it. They my do. dogs, my, I can put a bowl of salad on the floor and my dogs will go crazy for a bowl of salad. Um, another <laughs> very popular treat in the summer is melon. Watermelon is very cooling and they absolutely love it. So if it's 100 degrees out, go slice a watermelon and give it, share it with your dog. They'll love it. Oh, and, really? Wow. And, and actually, my cats will even come for a lot of this stuff as well. Um, and other things that I make my own freeze-dried treats, but you certainly can buy them. But I make my own freeze, uh, not freeze-dried, uh, dehydrated treats. So I will take a um, cookie sheet and put like a little baking rack on it and put just little strips of chicken breast or chicken liver or turkey or beef or whatever. And I or, you know, hearts, anything like that. Put them on the sheet, put it in the oven at the lowest temperature, and leave it in there overnight. And in the morning, when you come out, you have a whole sheet full of wonderfulness that your dogs will go crazy for. Really? Okay. All right. So this isn't – in other words, it's not hard to do it right. Oh, no, it and it's cheaper. It's cheaper. I almost said that too. Exactly right. To, to feed them right is cheaper, and they will be they will be just as thrilled uh, as they would be if you gave them what looks like a sausage that came in a bag. Right. That is full of all kinds of bad yeah. things. Right. So, right. you know, so then we have this this myth um, that they have to eat a complete and balanced meal. You have to have a complete and balanced meal in that bowl every single meal, every single day or your dog will die. Well, that's a myth that is perpetuated by the pet food companies and by the veterinarians who are selling the pet food uh, made by those pet food companies. My dogs eat homemade meals. And sometimes it's raw, sometimes it's cooked, just depending on, you know, whatever we're doing that day. And the great thing about making it myself is I know the quality of the ingredients. I will make an egg frittata when we have the same meal. And what we do is we look for balance over time, just like we do with people. And there are certain things that we have to be cognizant of. And so, you know, on my website and in my books, I talk about the the things that you would have to add to get it, you know, at least somewhat balanced. But I will tell you, I had a client that came in a couple of weeks ago. And she had a small dog and the dog was running around the room, looked pretty good. And that dog had been fed cooked hamburger and carrots. And that was the only thing the dog had eaten for three years. Oh, we're talking healthy, right? right. We're talking. Uh, So that is so far from a balanced diet. And yet this dog was now, you know, we tried to get things balanced up a little bit. I said, okay, well, we're going to have to add some things, you know, so his bones don't all dissolve over the next couple of years as he gets older. Yeah. Um, But, you know, it didn't die after three years of being fed an unbalanced diet. And yet your veterinarian and the pet food companies would have you believe that, oh, my gosh, you do that for a week and your dog's going to be dead. Oh, my goodness. This is fascinating. Now, your book, The Yin and Yang Nutrition for Dogs, which is doing so very well, does it talk about all of this, um, what to feed your dog and how to make the meals come out well for the dog and stuff? Yeah. The yes. snacks, all that stuff yes. that talks about. Yep. Okay. So we've got cookie recipes and a, a little um, liver fruit cake <laughs> that we made that we use, at, you know, oh. Christmas time. Um, <laughs> but it's got all <laughs> kinds of uh, dehydrated treats. And there's about 60 recipes for different meals. And the meals are based on your dog's personality. And we tell you how to figure out his personality from a Chinese medicine perspective, whether he's a wow. fire dog or a water dog or an earth dog. Oh, my goodness. Really? And, and uh, so then we also feed for, you know, for disease problems. So if you have a dog with kidney failure, liver failure, heart failure, or a breed that is prone to. So I have Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. And. A majority of them will develop mitral valve heart disease at some point in their life. So we have recipes to try to strengthen the heart and try to, you know, keep them alive longer. And I have a 17-year-old Cavalier at my house, so I would say we're, we're doing pretty well. <laughs> Absolutely well. And, and your, your 17-year-old dog is still healthy? Well, he finally, uh, about three months ago, developed heart disease. But 
it took until he was 17 and he's pretty arthritic and we got him when he was eight. He was a puppy mill breeding dog. So oh. by the time he was eight years old, he only had four teeth, which now he has none. Uh, he only had four teeth and he was already severely arthritic. So, oh my goodness. you know, for somebody in bad shape at yeah. eight, he's still running around, you know, chasing the girls. He's been neutered, but he. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, they, they still have an interest. Oh, yeah. Mean. He yeah. herds the girls, and he's all that, and then some. He rules the roost. <laughs> I love it. That is well. That is so encouraging to people who want their dogs to live longer. You took a dog at the age of eight who was, who was pretty damaged already by his breeding and the way he'd been treated, and that dog is still healthy and happy and comfortable at 17. Yep. <laughs> Which, and which I also I, it is. I also have two cocker spaniels who will both be seventeen in October. One of them I adopted at the age of five. The other one I adopted at the age of fourteen. And at the oh. age of fourteen, he came extremely broken, extremely just a mess. His skin, his ears. He actually ended up having both ear canals removed because the infection had actually was eating oh. away the bulk of his skull. Oh my lord, that's terrible. It is terrible, but let me tell you, he runs around, he runs up the stairs, they both run up the stairs, they run around the backyard, they eat like champs, and you to look at the dogs, you would have no idea that they are that old and that they had that many medical problems when oh we got them. That is fabulous. Well, how, what encouragement you're giving to people. Yeah, That's it's wonderful. never too late to make the change. Never. It isn't. Oh, that is so interesting. I mean, what, let me just say a couple of other things that you've said. You've said real food, table food, the same food you and I eat is the most nutritious food we can utilize to help our pets live longer, healthier lives. And you're living that. I, I was also troubled when you said that um, – Large breed dogs are suffering heart failure due to nutritional deficiencies in their kibble diets. That's yes. possible. So this is new. Uh, this is a study that just came out about two months ago, and the FDA is actually investigating, which they rarely get involved. That they're supposed to, but they don't. Uh, but uh, the grain free diets, which have been all the fad for the past few years. There's some sort of a connection where it's causing taurine deficiencies, which is an amino acid, which is leading to dilated cardiomyopathy. They're seeing it mostly in large breed dogs, but also in some small breed dogs. And it's something that we wouldn't normally see. And that's why it raised a red flag. Oh, my goodness. You also talk about uh, the, the notion that more than two thirds of dogs who are more than 10 years old will have a cancer diagnosis. And you think that that's related to um, uh the way they're, they've been treated medically and, and food-wise, I think that's astonishing. It's amazing what, what's put into our animals' pet food. Just knowing that as long as you feed them as well as you feed yourself, they'll be healthier, happier, and live much longer. That's all we re really need to know. But fortunately, Judy has a book out that will help you to do that in a way that also balances balances your dog's diet. What about cats, Judy? Do you talk about cats in the book, too? Um not that particular book. Most of the recipes could be tweaked uh, for cats, but cats really are obligate carnivores, and, which is another interesting thing about the pet food industry. They're obligate carnivores, and they really are meatosauruses. They should be eating a high meat diet. And so raw feeding or freeze-dried or uh, homemade diets for cats are, are perfect. If you think about what a cat eats in the wild, it's the mouse, the rabbit, you know, that's, yeah. and they're, they're eating the entire thing. The, Most, right, the, or the internal organs, too, that's that's yes. Right. And most so the little bit of carbohydrate they get in their diet would be the stomach contents of the mouse or the rabbit. Uh, but if we look at what is in dry pet food for cats, corn is very commonly the first ingredient. Uh -huh. And any any dry food, most people say, well, meat's the first ingredient. So it's high meat. No, any dry food, maximum meat content is 30 percent. And that's because it won't stick into a kibble with anything more than that. So you you have to know that you are not feeding a high meat diet to your carnivorous cat if you're feeding dry food. Oh wow. Okay. Well, um, I I is, but you say there is another book that would talk more about feeding so cats. I, I, yeah, my first book, uh, from needles to natural, from a few years ago, has a little bit more cat information. These recipes were specifically made for dogs. Um, there are a couple of 
I think uh, it's catinfo.org is a phenomenal website for kitties. So I'm promoting a friend uh, who has a lot of good recipes and tons of kitty cat information. Okay. That was, did you say catinfo.org? Yes. What did, yes. Okay. Well then write that down, everyone who has a cat, because um, one of the things we all love to do is promote one another as we do this work. But I know if you promote her, she must be good. So yep. let's, <laughs> let's, let's do that. So, all right, let's talk about something else. What, what are the biggest health dangers that just are around the house? Because I know I've heard of some like poinsettias. Is that a problem if you have a dog or a cat? No, oh, poinsettias get a bad rap. And I actually had a cat once who, uh, unbeknownst to me, was just chowing down on my poinsettia. And really? The cat, yeah, the cat kept vomiting and vomiting and vomiting. And I did it. This is what I was in my first year of practice. And the cat kept vomiting and fi- I couldn't figure out what was going on. So I finally did an exploratory on the cat. And when I opened up the stomach, it was full of poinsettia leaves. And I said, aha, you little stinker. You little <laughs> stinker, the poor thing. <laughs> so, yeah, so we had surgery because he was eating poinsettias. Um, oh and not telling me. But poinsettias (laughs) will cause vomiting and diarrhea, but not necessarily death unless you let them get too dehydrated and they they, they continue to munch on them. So you should put them up out of reach, but actually we have them in our house every year and now my animals are smart enough that they actually don't munch on them. avoid them. Good. Um, So what what else is a problem in your hand that people may not know about? uh, Grapes, raisins, macadamia nuts. Uh, So if you have like macadamia cookies, those are actually very toxic and you don't want to share those. Um, chocolate for sure. Yes. Uh, uh, most drugs and um, pharmaceuticals are going to be very dangerous. So, for instance, if you spill a bottle of Tylenol and your cat eats one Tylenol, that's a death sentence. So, really? Yes. Really? Cats are extremely sensitive to Tylenol, very sensitive to aspirin. Any of the non-steroidals, so like the um, naproxen or ibuprofen drugs, very, very dangerous for animals. Really? Um, Certainly, you know, like seizure medications, ADD medications, um, you know, anything mind-altering, very dangerous for our pets. Things that we don't commonly think about are chemicals or rug deodorizers or shampoos that we're using on our floors. If you think about where your pet spends most of their time, they're on the floor, they're on the rug, they're walking on it, they're licking their paws. And if you are using chemical cleaners, they are getting a really high dose of that. So you might want to look at using more natural cleaners. I mean, one of my favorite cleaners is just white vinegar. Dilute white vinegar is great for mopping floors. Uh, oh. so there's a lot of things that you can do. I mean, lemon water is also really good for cleaning. Lavender water is very good for cleaning. So a lot of things you can do. I find a lot of animals that are allergic are, uh, you know, and they're just breaking out in sores. When I finally get the owners to fess up, I find out they're using carpet powders, you know, the deodorizing powders or sprays. Oh, Yeah. And, and uh, oh. that's that's very, you know, our pets are very sensitive. And remember that their sense of smell is 100 times what ours is. Right. So if you're spraying an air deodorizer, I find them annoying personally, but I can't imagine what my dogs think, you know, oh, scented yes. candles. And yes. uh, one of the new things that got talked about a lot this past Christmas, apparently the little essential oil diffusers were a huge thing this Christmas, and it will kill cats. Uh, oh, Cats are very sensitive to essential oils, and so you have that in your bedroom, and your cat's sleeping in your bed with you, and the problem is it's a hidden killer. It will cause liver damage, so that's happening inside your cat, and you don't Uh. realize there's a problem until they're on death's doorstep, and it's not fixable. So be be careful with essential oils. Um, Make sure you talk with, you know, somebody who knows something about essential oils for animals if you are going to diffuse or use them in your house. Wow. Well, um, I'd like to talk a little bit about, and thank you for all of that. I mean, I didn't know most of that stuff, so you were you really helped a lot of people today just talking about that. But let's talk a little bit about after-death communication, because I hear these stories, but of course there's much less of that kind of communication that's spectacular or that that is, uh, um, you know, out in the room from dogs than from cats. What do people tell you who have lost their pets? Do you hear any stories? I do. And I actually used to have an animal communicator who worked in my practice alongside me every day. And that was kind of fun. Um, Yeah, I'm (laughs) sure. I learned all kinds of things. Uh, And, you know, he actually diagnosed bladder stones in a dog. You know, this dog was really sick and it had skin disease and I just couldn't figure out what was going on. And he looked at the dog and he said, his bladder hurts. 
And I said, no, he's got skin problems. No, his bladder hurts. And so, you know, we went and took x-rays and I said, oh my gosh, he's full of bladder stones. (laughs) Oh my. Okay. That's wonderful. (laughs) Yeah. So So, so this this communicator was able to talk to people and help you diagnose their, I mean, talk to dogs, help you diagnose their illnesses. That's, that's a great feature of your practice. It is. Well, and I, he's not here anymore, but I get people all the time who take their animals to communicators and then then they'll come in and they'll go, well, the the communicator told me his back hurts. So I need you to fix his back. I'm like, okay. Uh, You know, and people are afraid to, to, you know, like they 